see there in the right actually, they're next to mine, they're completely different, I think. And uh, I suppose that Lucy had seen while we were the, the portrait, which I think was a paper of oil, which I think was a sort of extra version of me, seeing a sort of more uh, introvert, neurotic me inside, <laughs> which he decided to explore in the action. Or possibly, I sometimes thought it was just the whole context change. Uh, oil would be done in the evening, which is a more exciting time of day. We would feel a bit more up and we talked a lot. But the action, which is done in natural life, is in the afternoon. And it's sort of like, for me, it was a bit of a flat time after lunch. Right? There wasn't so much conversation. I was sort of, we were sort of running out of conversation a bit after my year. We started talking to each other as well. So it was all the other quiet. Well, I, in order to prepare this evening, I read Martin's book um, studiously, but found myself gripped by it. I hope you have a chance, maybe I do recommend you get it, because it's obviously about uh, Martin's experience of sitting for Freud, but it's very much about art, and it's about identity, it's about um, the conversations that they had about art, going to exhibitions together, exchanging ideas about what's going on in the world. But I was very interested that this length of time that you sat for was obviously when you come into the space of the studio, um, which is a very subjective space, I think, where Freud is obviously involved in his own thoughts, but you also reflect on thinking about who you were, really, and what was coming through and what he was seeing. Yes, it's not a marvelly existential You can sort of drift off after a bit and new stuff. Um, so there's nothing very to do except be there, so you don't have to uh, perform or act. So uh, he'll throw it in at himself a little bit, uh, which is actually I found quite nice. I, I compared it to uh, a combination of transcendental meditation and visit to the bar because there's a sort of Thank you. 
experience this work. Yeah. Um, this is her here. Yeah. And um, she said, that, and she'd never told me this before, she's told me lots of things about what it was like to do with Lucian. But for the paintings, he never wore his glasses. For the etchings, he would put his glasses on. <laughs> and I found that fascinating. And in a few minutes, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I just wanted to ask you if that was your experience. So physically, my process was very different, except that you can never sit down. The head was my action. He had a chair there, which he was thinking of sitting down to work, but he never managed to sit for more than 15 seconds. So he was constantly springing up and going, walking back, and then appearing to So all that was the same as the painting, but the actual process was very much closer to work. Uh, there was something I wanted to say about the genesis of the ancient world together, which is this book, which is at least one story that uh, he, in general, quite rightly, was never influenced at all by what critics had to say. Uh, but when he was a young man, he found himself continually reading uh, columns, reviews, in which uh, the critics said, Lucian Ford's drawings are very fine, but his paintings were a bit. And he said, well, we can't have the thought pass through his mind, well, we can't have that. So he, uh, there is a sort of tremendous change in his work in the nice books of the mid 50s, where earlier on, there's a lot of drawing, a lot of graphic work, less painting. And from that sort of, sort of great turning point, the painting becomes the primary thing he did. And there are far fewer drawings. And then, the last 30 years or so, this, uh, he, he came up with etching as the, his form of work on paper. And what he always said about it, when I asked him, what do you want to do with this etching? Is, I want it to work like a painting, or I want the etching to work like a paint. So that was, that's not that right. That's not that right. I mean, etching is an art form in itself. So and it's the closest link between drawing and painting, it's the link between. And I think Lucian's passion was to try and make masks with, with the um, scratching closest that you could to painting in a sort of three-dimensional aspect of it. They certainly have that projection on the voluminous
I will be speaking to you how it happened. Uh, one of those variations that Lucien chose out of many, that's what you see on the walls. There were many others. And that is uh, the printing. It's not the, just the drawing. It's the drawing plus the printing which makes the prints you see. And my preoccupation on the whole, with talking with Lucien and so on, to create whatever you see on the wall uh, with his instructions and my interpretation of his instructions. And at the end, he was presented 12 variations of the same print. I will be showing you one example. And out of those 12, uh, David was there most of the time. Uh, three of us, we looked at the prints, and of course, uh, David and I, we didn't want to interfere too much, but Lucien was very open to suggestions. Uh, people may think that in such an important painter like Lucien, who has such a long uh, standing experience in visual language and painting and drawing and uh, he will have such great confidence on his abilities. Lucien was open to suggestions even from people like me and David. And uh, not because we are not knowledgeable, uh, I know, but, but we cannot compare ourselves to Lucien, of course. And that showed a line of character that Lucian has not been acknowledged about. He was not an arrogant, uh, condescending artist. He was very modest and very open. And that is something that people miss about Lucian when they write about him. Not always, but sometimes. Uh, especially when people don't have first-hand experience uh, knowing me as a person rather than as a painter. Thank uh, you. Beautiful. Such cut in there for a because Martin has to go. Mission. 
children and sell together. And Kitch is just going to give you a brief history of the project, which is going to make some time. Thank you. Well, um, I'd just like to add uh, my thanks to the, uh, our esteemed uh, speakers here and also particularly to thank all of you for coming because to see a packed room for a print event uh, is a wonder to behold. I'm just concentrating on that and seeing if I can preserve that because it is a fairly rare beast um, for much of our careers, uh, the print departments uh, around the world work in the shadows. Um, and we leave the spotlight to our colleagues in uh, uh, contemporary and impressionists. But occasionally, uh, we're fortunate enough to deal with a collection which sort of tugs the spotlight a little back a bit towards our way so that we can share with a wider audience uh, the wonderful field of printmaking. Uh, and I just hope that you all can take away with you a better understanding for those of you who are new to the field of printmaking. There's a lot of misunderstanding uh, surrounding it. You can take away a little greater understanding into the riches uh, that, uh, that, that we deal with. Now, my uh, relationship with uh, Studio Prince goes back 10 years. I checked this out before I came. But I first wrote to, to uh, Mark and Dorothea. I'm sure Dorothea's here, but they weren't very much as a pair. I wrote a very cheeky letter. Um, it came about when I was uh, flicking through uh, Craig Hartley's book on uh, Lucian Freud's printmaking. And I thought, well, hang on a minute, basically half this book has been printed by one, uh, one firm, Studio Prince, and I thought I should get to know these people. And the reason was, apart from the obvious commercial motives, yes, thank you, that, uh, but uh, the reason was that it's, if, if any of you get an opportunity, to go to a print studio, I urge you to grab it with both hands because, in, in a very real sense, it's a place where magic happens. If you ever go to a print studio, I hope I'm not treading on any toes here, you may initially think there's a certain sort of organised chaos going on, there's a lot of, there's a lot of tins, there's a lot of seemingly dirt, which of course it is not, certainly not a studio print, big bits of machinery, and, it, and you can't believe that out of that, and out of this strange alchemy, of a sheet of copper, a sheet of paper, and black ink. These marvellous things uh, appear. And it really is an absolute um, uh, wonder to behold. So, within that, I was particularly interested, and, and Mark has touched, touched on that, and I hope you'll go into that in greater detail the relationship between an artist and a master printer. Because, in a sense, I always want to find out well, who's in charge, who's the boss, who's, who's running this. You know, what I realised very quickly talking to both Mark and Dorothy, yeah, that was the wrong, wrong question to ask. I mean, there was even an answer to that. Um, because it seemed to me, well, the, the artist would go to the printer because the printer knew how to print and he didn't. So effectively, surely the printer was in charge and he didn't tell him what to do. But then, of course, you think, well, hang on a minute, there's got to be the artist as well from the running the show because at the end of the day, it's his job he wants to see. And it's a lot more subtle than that, and Mark hopefully will go into that, in that, yes, he's leading the artist, uh, but the artist is, is still in charge, and it's, it's a relationship which I think is, is, is a highly specialised one. And when I interviewed both of them for the foreword that I, that I wrote for the, the catalogue, we were broken around for a metaphor of simile, um, and Mark came up with a rather prosaic, but I think very apt one, of a, a passenger and a taxi driver. And the passenger decides where to go, and the taxi driver decides how to get there. And this is the, this helps, I think, to explain the relationship between between the two. And to uh, to extend the taxi metaphor a little further, it is clear that Mark has the knowledge. You know, he has the great knowledge, uh, uh, and the proof of that is here. Uh, I should mention um, there's obviously there are other four events going on uh, around this time, uh, various gallery shows. And Gallery, which uh, David will hopefully touch on because he's intimately involved in putting that together. And far be it from me to put this up against that, but I, I should mention there is one advantage is that, with a few exceptions, you can get to take these home. <laughs> very, you know, very, I really do want you to take that. <laughs> As is, you can take that piece of going away with you this evening. The sale is in roughly about the time, it's on the 15th of February. Um, I hope to see you all during the preview and I definitely hope to see you during the sale. <laughs> <laughs>
Don't forget there's a third party involved in many of these, um, which is the model. And being a sitter or a model in a portrait is itself a creative process. And Lucian would have been lost without the people that basically gave up their lives mm -hmm. for long periods of time for him. This painting took six months to make, four nights a week, not days a week, four nights a week, and took eight hours per night. And when the painting was finished, this extraordinary woman said that her feet had bumped in size. <laughs> and you can see why, can't you? In fact, if you've look seen David's photographs of Lucian's studio or even visited the studio, you'll know that behind where Sophie is standing there is actually a radiator. And she got quite a serious mouth open there. <laughs> she would sit leaning against this radiator, getting quite warm, or at least part of it getting quite warm. And she said she learned to sleep standing up like a horse. And in the middle of the six months, Lucian said to her, I want you to go to Colmar and see the great Grunewald altarpiece, and then come back and we'll carry on the painting. And that was it. They didn't discuss why. So Sophie packs the bags, goes off to Colmar, looks at Grunewald's extraordinary altarpiece, and also had a, with a, a painting that was very important for Francis Bacon, and they carry on the painting. So again, make of that what you will. But the rags are a very important component of this picture. And Lucian has a habit of wiping his brushes, chucking the rag, and wiping his brushes, chucking the rag, and then a week later, two weeks later, a year later. And over the years, the rags pile up. I don't know what sort of cleaning they <laughs> But the rags just became a mountain in the studio that then become part of the works. And you can see, you can almost date Freud's paintings by the size of the pile of rags. <laughs> now, I just put those in to show you how they start to kind of creep in. But I wanted to show you this again, wonderful picture of Sophie. Um, this one, I mentioned that the previous one, the take picture, took six months. This, according to Sophie's memory, took 14 months. 14 months of painting. And the reason that I wanted to look at this one, and this one I, I understand that this will be in the National Portrait Gallery show, um, which is, I think, a great, great painting, and the greatest of the Sophie paintings, you'll see it over there. And um, it's called, I think, Girl, oh, Head and Shoulders of a Girl there. This is called Lying by the Rags. But what I've done with this image is coincidentally that beautiful white patch at the front is the light, the light bulb, the electric light bulb reflecting in the floorboard. She looks like some great beach dolphin, doesn't she? <laughs> and the rags themselves are like a, a surge of a wave crashing on the beach. But no matter, I'm going in poetic directions, let's stop that, shall we? Um, I want to hone in on that part of the picture that the print focuses upon and then put the print alongside it. Now one thing we've not mentioned so far is that when you are drawing on your plate, what you're seeing printed comes out the other way around. And so what I've done, courtesy of the magic of PowerPoint, is flipped it to see how it looked like when Lucian was actually drawing this. And you'll see it's slightly different. Now what I wanted to know from Sophie when I called her earlier this week is how the painting relates to the print, and David and Martin have already indicated on that. But uh, what I wanted to know is that is the print made from the finished painting? And Sophie said, no, the painting was completely finished, and then the etching was made as a completely separate exercise. And sometimes, I think she said she was in six of, the, of Lucien's prints, sometimes he would actually make the print first and finish the print and then make the painting. So they are two separate things. It's not that he's using the painting as a springboard for 
footprint because you can see that there's a slightly different angle there. And this is where the glasses come in. And the way that Freud's paintings are made, of course, a brush mark, as I mentioned with the painting of Frank Alvar, a brush mark retains its identity as a brush mark. You can measure it, it has a thickness, a width. You don't need to focus on what you are actually looking at. And Lucien's work is about looking. It's about eyesight. And I actually did talk to him about this idea of working without his glasses, because he was quite, quite um, adamant that when he made his paintings, he did not wear his glasses. He wanted to make paintings of what he was seeing. But when it comes to the prints, because he's working with not thick, broad brush marks, but with a line. All of these things are lines, remember. There is no tone process of working like apple tint. It is all line. The tones are achieved by, as Mark has pointed out, these cross hatchings, this incredible way of inventing different kinds of lines, little curly flecks or little dots or whatever. It's all line. So it's a different way of translating the visual experience into marks. Now, what I want to do next is just look at one or two precedents. Looking at this one first, which is, I think is just such a beautiful thing. Um, one of the portraits of um, his mother, there is the most beautiful paintings as well as this extraordinary print. But I looked at Jura, and um, Lucy's relationship with the National Gallery was a very, very deep one. And I'm looking at the print he made from our little Chardin school district over there, which he made in the 1999-2000 or so for an exhibition that we call The Encounters. Um, but looking at the portrait of his mother, well, who else did portraits of their mum? Rembrandt. And Rembrandt likewise uses line. It's a process about using line. And Richard mentioned about how print is usually in poor relation. Um, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes and do a plea for you to think about print seriously. Print is not the poor relation of painting. A great artist like Lucien Freud or Picasso or Rembrandt or Degas, you cannot appreciate or understand or get to know them as an artist without fully engaging with everything that they did. And for Lucien Freud, print making is just as important as his painting. He does not treat it as, oh, I have a little bit of time off now and do something that's not quite so important. It's just as significant. It's part of the creative process. The fact that they are not in colour, the fact that they, they do not sell for millions and billions, does not devalue them in terms of their artistic um, value. And if I could choose a work of art to own, it would be my Rembrandt. If someone said, you can choose anything you want by Rembrandt in the world, I wouldn't choose a painting. I would actually choose a print, something like this, that is that big. Because in the prints, there is some kind of magical quality that in the public performance of a painting, I find that you don't have. Here we have the man from the National Gallery saying, actually, print is <laughs> more significant than painting. I honestly do feel that, and I just want to finish by looking at a couple of other things. Because, well, look at Sophie behind me. She doesn't actually like that. She's rather gorgeous and beautiful. Um, <laughs> but um, this is a Rembrandt print from the early 1630s. When Rembrandt made these things, people's mouths dropped open. But you can't do things like that. What Rembrandt is doing is parodying the classical tradition. This is his piece taking of Michelangelo. It's a Michelangelo pose from the Sistine ceiling, but instead of a powerful, young, muscle-bound man, he's chosen a rather saggy middle-aged lady. Good for you, Rembrandt. And there were little rhymes and jokes about Rembrandt, showing that when you look at Rembrandt new, you can see the marks of the corsets. Um, this is what Lucien's about. This is what Rembrandt's about. Look at her. Isn't she just amazing? Another 16th century Rembrandt print. It's actually Diana, the goddess Diana. You haven't seen her looking like that before. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, well, the anger of existentialism. Here is um, Lucien's The Big Man, a powerhouse of a painting. Um, next to anger is Madame Mortessier. Now, when Lucien did the Chardin work, 
and made a little film with him. And he wouldn't be in it. He, he, he recorded his voice in it. We did some conversations about Shardan in it. Um, but um, I asked him once the, the technical had stopped rolling about this painting because Lucian selected one of our artist eye exhibitions at the National Gallery where we would invite artists to choose what they wanted from the collection to put it all together in whatever order they wanted to with examples of their own work. One of the paintings that Lucian chose was Agatha's Madame Montessier. Now look at the reflection of Madame Montessier. How it gives her that volumetric generosity. Look at the reflection of the big man. Look also at the light source, because Anne works with the light falling flat onto Madame Montessier. The easy way of doing a portrait is to get the light coming from the side. So you've got highlights, so you've got shadows that gives you that shortcut to get in three dimensions. Anne likes the light to fall flat which means he's reliant upon his draftsmanship to give him a sense of volume. Look at the light on the big man. It falls flat on him, doesn't it? So with the lighting, with the mirror, I said to Lucian, now when you did your big man, were you thinking about Madame Montessier? And he paused and he said, yes, of course I was thinking about Madame Montessier. <laughs> And then he talked a bit more, well, I'm thinking, well, I'll write that down. <laughs> and I can put a short notice in the Burlington magazine. He talks of Agnes, I don't want to on the way, etc. Then he paused, and then he said, but when I was making the big man, I was also thinking about Rembrandt. I was thinking about Titian. I was thinking about Rubens. I was thinking about Michelangelo. I was thinking about Chardin. I was thinking about Goya. I was thinking about Surma. Okay, okay, I get that. <laughs> that's really how I want to finish. That Lucian had this fascination with the art of the past. He needed the art of the past. And in his own words, he said, I, I treat going to the National Gallery like a visit to the doctor. If I have a problem, I go to the doctor. If I have a problem with a painting, I go to the doctor and he cures. <coughs> so that's my, my fascination with Freud, is that his identity, his relationship with the past, but also his prints to me are breathtaking. And I'm so looking forward to the National Portrait Gallery show. I'd be looking forward to this room just as much. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
he put his plate on an easel <coughs> in Rome. And that is quite unusual. But being a painter and drawing from models or drawing in his garden, he needed that kind of setting for his work. I started working with Lucien in 1986. It was Celia Paul who one day came to do uh, to work with me. She said, I have a very good painter friend. He is called Lucien Freud. Would you work with him because he wants to do some etchings? I said, yes, of course, I would love to work with him. Then I wasn't completely sure that it would happen until one day Lucien rang and said, I have a play that I want to bring it and show it to you. And that's how we started working together. Now, uh, Lucien came to England in 1933 as a child. And uh, from Germany. And uh, his childhood experiences and so on probably uh, memories stayed with him and influenced his work, although it is not really analyzed in a big way how much those childhood memories influenced his later work. We think of his work uh, nudes and portraits, but when you look at these portraits and when you look at the nudes, it is not what they look really. If you look at them, there is a lot of anxiety in his work, a lot of tension, a lot of uh, kind of worry. And uh, when he started doing etching, he started with little plates. And what I did was prepare the plates for him, and then he take them home, draw on the plates, and come back and we had a coffee. He liked Middle Eastern coffee I made. And then we had a little chat. But just, just, we, it was very informal. And then the work started, the plates went in the acid, and normally it was about an hour. And then I took a print, and he took the print and went home, or he went to see his friend, friend Howard. Uh, then he ringed me and said, it's okay, uh, you can print it, proof it. Or he'll say, uh, it's no good, uh, I'm abandoning it. Fortunately, he didn't abandon many plates, but it was quite quick. And when first time he said, I'm abandoning that plate, I was quite reassured that I was dealing with a painter with great integrity about his own work. That after spending weeks, maybe months, drawing a play, within a minute or two, seeing the result, he could decide that it was not what he wanted and he just scrapped it. Normally, if he accepted it, so it would have been published, sold, and he would have made quite a lot of money. But it wasn't, unlike uh, a lot of things written about Lucien, he was not that concerned about the money. Uh, and uh, as a result, he could reject the play. Uh, Normally, he made three or four plates a year. And uh, when the plates were etched and he accepted, there was the proofing. The proofing is when the artist comes to the workshop with the printer, the printer takes variations of that, from that plate. Uh, and then the artist looks and says, uh, I want this to be a bit darker, a bit lighter. Uh, and gives instructions, and then the printer follows the instructions. Sometimes the printer has ideas, uh, shows the artist what's possible to do from that plan. Uh, normally, that's, that's about the way it goes. But after a while, Lucien didn't want to come anymore. He'd <coughs> give the plate to me, and he'd say, proof it, 
and when it's ready, I'll come and see the result. And normally I did 12, I did more than 12, but I showed him 12, selected 12 prints, variations of each image, or thereabouts. And he came later on with David. And I will have the prints set in the workshop. And he had a look at the prints and he chose the one he wanted. Um, it's possible, with etching, it's possible to vary. Um, if one can use, one makes different things, wipes the plate differently. Now, this is a print. When you see all these prints, the plates are all the same. Um, there isn't any different work on the plates. The plates are all drawn um, with a needle without tone. Uh, only the tone of the lines and... Now this is without a tone. This is all these plates will print like this. If it was ink and printed, they will all print like this. In this case, This is slightly darker. Now this has a little bit more tone left, more ink left, very transparent ink left on that plate. Now this, this one, so this one has more ink left on the plate. And this one is even darker. So you can imagine now 12 of these, 12 variations. So some plates, some prints, he wanted dark, like the garden. His instruction was dark print. And that was enough for me to decide how far to the light or how far to the dark I will go. So, and within that, I had to print the uh, 12 variations. There is one very dark print there, you'll see later on. Uh, Lucien was a very, very courteous man. First time before he came, I was very apprehensive because I read a lot about him uh, and not always flattering things and how difficult he was. And when he came, I was very, very pleasantly surprised. He was very informal, he was very pleasant, very courteous, and one can almost say he was absolutely normal. <laughs> <laughs> and so within, because one reads about him, I mean, one read about him, so is, is sort of misbehavior and this and that. And he was a very, very clever person. And as I said earlier on, and he was very modest, despite his fame and his importance. We had, we didn't just uh, work. He often would tell some anecdotes, uh, some things from his childhood, and so it all helped to relax the situation, the atmosphere, and the work proceeded in a very pleasant way. Uh, and the anecdote of him he tell a joke, uh, his grandfather told him, uh, I'll tell you uh, the joke, it's, it's a psychological joke, I think. Uh, it's about two people leaving the also by train sitting in one compartment, and one of them says to the other, where are you going? And he says, I'm going to Krakow. It's silence for a minute or two, and the other person says, where are you going? He says, I'm going to Poznan. There is silence, and one of them says, 
isn't technology wonderful? We are going in opposite directions. <laughs> <laughs> like a teacher in this 
one. In the other one, she doesn't look as if she can teach. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's the print plan. And I think uh, you now, uh, you have time to ask questions to David, or to me, or to Sorry.
um, David, is that when you saw the portrait, say the naked, so the naked portrait or your etched um, portrait, um, did it change the way you saw yourself? I mean, what was the experience um, like of seeing yourself yeah. through the forehead? I don't analyze it too much. <laughs> <laughs> you, it's, because of the period of time, it takes so long, you just live through it, it becomes part of it. And it's um, the treatment of Boston again. But I don't know. Different result. 
he didn't want the same from every place. So that was left to me to do uh, somehow uh, make the play print the way he was intended in his thinking. Uh, so you see that they look different. Uh, and that is the printing. The difference between you know, the dark background, the light background, uh, some parts, turn, even turn, or dark turn, light turn, it's all in the printing. But uh, one must not forget that they are Lucien's prints. They are his work, his intentions, and I'm very uh, pleased that I could do what he intended to be done. Um, did Freud do multiple acid parts to get some areas darker than others, or are all the tone? No, uh, the whole play was immersing the acid in one go, and the acid I used was ferric chloride. Ferric chloride is an acid which is opaque, you don't see what's happening, but doesn't infuse and fights cleanly. So, nitric acid doesn't quite mean it. But uh, for actors and artists and so on, they choose their acid to suit their intentions. Uh, nitric acid gives you rough lines, ferric chloride gives you clean lines. Also, the difference is that with ferric chloride, you can have close, very close lines, like cross hatching and it will bite cleanly. Uh, nitric acid bites width-wise as well as in depth. So the lines get wider, and if they are very close, before they are bitten deep enough, they will join together, and then the drawing will change its character completely. But some artists like that. Uh, but in Lucien's case, uh, it wasn't something uh, he or me, uh, we wanted to happen. I mean, his drawing is so important, his lines. He sharpened his needle. Normally, etchers don't sharpen their needle, don't sharpen their needle. Uh, the etching needle is rounded at the tip so that it doesn't scratch the metal. If the metal is scratched, the acid will start attacking that scratched part very quickly, immediately, while the rest, where it isn't scratched, it will be much slower. Uh, but he wanted that, and you see the variation of the line, and I had to write it so precisely that that character didn't get lost. And also another problem was the size. The needle is the same size, the thickness of the line is the same on big prints as well as on small ones. But if the big prints were written uh, the same length of time, uh, the thickness of the line, would have, the drawing would have looked much weaker than on a small plane. So one had to adjust quite a lot of things. Keeps 
if there is any contention later on, if the artist says, I don't like this edition, the only reference point is the proof, Bona Tire, which is the security for the printer and the workshop, and for the artist, if there is any problem. So if the artist says, I don't like the proof, the printer will put the Bona Tire, put side by side, if the prints don't match, the artist wins. If the prints match, the print wins. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to bring um, the panel discussion to a close. As I say, I'm very excited reading Martin Gaines' book, which has very different ways of discussing the experience of being friends with Freud, kind of studio, <coughs> sitting, and reflections on art um, in very broad and interesting ways. Um, but I hope this evening you felt maybe something quite special about an event like this. And as I say, in maybe another 10 years, we won't have an event like this about Freud, because we're in the room with people who've had very close working relationships with Freud, artists, models, um, people who've had conversations with him. And I feel a very strong energy and vibration and connection to the artist's practice. And you hope with any experience that you have with art that it does actually change you maybe in some way, change your experience of the world. And I think from this evening, just with that level of detail and connection you've had to the working process and sense of looking, Hopefully all of you will go out into the world with um, a greater sense of this eye that Freud had. Freud had. So it's just one passage I think I came across yesterday where Martin describes his sensation of being really, of his sense of what this experience of being in his body was like, maybe seeing himself through the experience of sitting with Freud. So we're going to end with this. Okay. But in the studio, being under ceaseless observation does not feel like that. It is as even at a deep instinctive level, you realise that, as in a doctor's surgery or a hairdresser's shop. It is not you that's under scrutiny at any particular moment, but only an aspect of you. How, for example, the muscles connect together beneath your cheek. The overall effect is more disconnecting and disconcerting. You are unusually conscious of the surface of yourself, the skin, the flesh, and consequently of what it is inside the bubble, a mass of buzzing thoughts and sensations. It raises the question that occurs to everybody in childhood and at intervals thereafter, what is this thing called me? That is, of course, the central enigma of portraiture. And he said, never having looked at myself before with this level of intensity and in such detail and through the objective eye of another, I am at first puzzled by what I see. Eventually I may accept it as a surrogate for myself, whatever that means. This is what, rightly or wrongly, we ought to do with portraits. Um, thank you very so much. It's about the signature. <laughs> the Lucian always signed by initials. LF. So always. And so he, in the printing process, there is the BAT. Uh, which is kept with the world by the world. So that is their security for any contention and their reference. Uh, then Lucien signed two printers' proofs for me. Uh, and some of them it's written printers' proof completely, or PP, which is the first letters for printers' proof, which is accepted law. Also, Everything Lucien uh, signed, almost everything, is numbered. I wanted everything to be numbered so that there was no question later on. Uh, it has been in the past problems with artist proofs, uh, unnumbered, or uh, some other, lots of other drinks floating about, signed. And so uh, just sign AP or artist proof or whatever. So that was very important. So uh, the edition number of Lucien's editions is normally 46 because he thought that uneven numbers are not lucky. So he, he signed 46 prints as an edition, 12 prints as artist proofs, two printers proofs. 
And when there are there were two or three leftover prints, I gave them to him so that he presented to his models or to his friends. But some prints don't have that because there weren't any prints left. And the ones they have, it's not more than three, except two images. And uh, one is Pluto H. 